Well, uh, good morning, everybody. It's good to see all of the NRES students, of course, and a few guests. Uh, welcome here uh, this morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sean Hutchinson, and uh, I'm an associate professor in the Department of Geography and director of the NRES secondary major. And at least for this semester, along with Dr. Tricia Moore, one of the two uh, capstone faculty advisors uh, for, uh, for our NRES class. Again, welcome to everybody. Uh, to our first uh, NRES seminar of the spring semester, first of about four or five that we'll have here this spring. And I wanna make sure before I introduce today's uh, speaker, uh, I wanna make sure that I thank the sponsors of the NRES seminar series, uh, which include the Office of the Provost, the College of Agriculture, the College of Arts and Sciences, and the Department of Biological and Agricultural Engineering. Um, I have written an introduction, and I'm going to stick to it here today. Um, I, I would say that probably today's talk is one that's been about two years in the making. Uh, so I, I couldn't be happier that uh, Dr. Jim Stack is, is here today. Dr. Stack is a professor in the Department of Plant Pathology. He's also the director of the Great Plains Diagnostic Network. Uh, which is a nine-state consortium and one of the regions within the National uh, Plant Diagnostic Network. Over the last couple of years, it's probably been more common for me to bump into Dr. Stack at an airport somewhere across the United States, usually Dallas or Chicago, uh, as he is either getting ready to depart for or coming back from some exotic global location. And as I found out this morning, uh, he'll be headed to Australia tomorrow. So uh, again, we appreciate him being here. Uh, his science is in high demand, and it's in high demand around the world, and I really do appreciate his time today and his willingness to share some of that expertise and his insight uh, with us here in the NRES program. Uh, I could go on, uh, but I think I'll, I'll stop and not waste any more time and, and introduce Dr. Jim Steck. Thank you very much, Sean. Good morning. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time telling you what we do. Uh, in my lab, but spend most of the time telling you why we do what we do and try to get you to think about what we believe are some of the most pressing challenges this century. And of course, I'm a plant person, so I'm going to try to convince you that a lot of these pressing problems revolve around plants and how we view plants and what we're doing with them. So that's the goal, um, and I, I'm going to try to cover a lot of ground in a short period of time. So, have you talked about introduced non-native species in some of your classes? So you all have an idea of what they are and, 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 and what they do. Every year we intentionally introduce trillions of non-native organisms into habitats around the world. We do this intentionally. That's over 10 trillion organisms onto over 700 million hectares globally. It's wheat, it's maize, it's rice, and it's potato. It's the crops that we depend upon for our food supply. They're not native to most of the acreage on which they're grown. Human health is dependent upon introduced non-native species. So introduced non-native species are a good thing. I'm guessing you didn't hear that in your classes. Every year, we accidentally introduce millions of non-native plants into habitats around the world, causing economic loss, ecological disruption, biodiversity loss, species extinction. Human well-being is often challenged by introduced non-native species. So introduced non-native species can be a bad thing. The lesson is the primary reason we care about introduced non-native species is the consequence of their introduction. If we derive benefit, great. If we incur harm, not so good. The challenge, one of the challenges we have is determining which ones are good and which ones are bad before they're introduced. 
And the second challenge is detecting them and intercepting the bad ones before they're introduced. That can be really difficult when we're dealing with microbial pathogens. Phytosanitary regulations, the regulatory apparatus we have in place to protect plant systems, is based on the name of the organism. It's based on names. So you need to correctly identify the organism if you're going to successfully keep out the bad ones. What's in a name? So I developed the John Smith scenario. There's a bad John Smith in the world, and we want to keep John out of the United States. Well, his name's going to be on his passport and his other identification documents. So when he tries to come into a port of entry, we will intercept him. There are many flights each day from the UK into the United States, so we'll just watch for John Smith. We'll alert the inspectors, if you see John Smith, let's keep him out. However, there are over 5,000 John Smiths in England. Which one? There are 46,560 John Smiths in the United States. So we already have a background population of John Smith, so if he slips through, how do we find him? ID by name is not enough, yet that is what our regulations to protect plant systems are based on. People change their names. <laughs> so we want to keep John Smith out, but what if he changed his name to Fred Jones? He's coming in. Well, we regularly change the names of organisms. <clears throat> Excuse me. As we learn more about organisms, we realize that we misname them. And so when you look in the literature for an organism, you can oftentimes for, find four, five, six names for the same organism. So which one do you use when you're trying to make a decision? That's what we do in the Plant Biosecurity Lab. This is my team. We study emerging and recurrent pathogens. We look at their population biology and genetics so we can better figure out who they are and what they're capable of. We study their invasion biology, how they get in, what do they do after they're introduced. It's all in the realm of plant biosecurity and its impacts on human health and well-being, specifically food security that we'll talk about today. We spend a lot of time on genome-informed diagnostics, and I'll explain what that means in a minute. We've selected target organisms that operate at the interface of the three main living systems that occupies most of our thinking. We look at two fungi and two bacterial pathogens. <laughs> These operate at the plant health public health interface. Currently we have projects in Europe and Middle East, in South America, in Australia and New Zealand. Um, we're looking at trying to discriminate at subspecific levels. So it's not good enough to know that Pseudomonas syringae, path of our actininity, is an organism we want to keep out of the United States. We actually have to know if it's the actininity from southern Italy or the one from New Zealand. That's a very fine level of discrimination and we have a lot of background noise. Pseudomonas syringae as a species is everywhere. It's in rain, it's in snow, it's in the waters, it's on plants. So you have to look for very small differences in these organisms in order to be able to identify which ones are the bad ones. So what we do is we sequence their genomes. We extract their DNA and we find out all the genetic capability of that organism. And then we study these different genes. You don't have to take notes on some of these, but, but this is just an array of genes in this organism. And we find which genes are absent in a certain population or which genes are present in a population that are not in the other ones. And then we base our diagnostics on that. And what you're seeing here, these four lines, are a region of the genome of that organism, Pseudomonas, so it's the same region in four different strains. Look how different they are. And what's interesting is this is pathogenic, this is non-pathogenic, and this non-pathogenic strain is missing the entire region. That's a, so it helps. 
But if we look at other pathogenic and non-pathogenic, you can see these are really difficult to tell apart. And so you start looking at very small things and say, well, this gene's present in this one but absent here. This one's present here and absent there. And you start building your diagnostics around those specific genetic regions that distinguish one strain or population from another. So that's kind of what we do. One of the other organisms that we work with is called Rathiobacter toxicus. It's a select agent in the United States. That means it's considered a, a very high threat organism. Now the reason, it's a really cool organism. This organism is very cool. It infects flowers, and if the infection happens early enough, a seed doesn't develop. A bacterial gall develops. That bacterial gall, at the end of the year, when the seeds are all mature on that head, the bacterial gall falls to the soil, and it overwinters there, or over summers. And then in the spring, when the rains come, to allow the seeds to germinate, the seeds imbibe the water, germinate, the bacterial gall imbibes the water, and the bacteria become active. But bacteria have no real way to get from the soil onto the plant. So they've evolved to be dependent upon a nematode, a small threadworm, swims through the soil, picks up the bacterium, carries it onto the plant. The nematode goes up to the top of the plant and waits for the plant to flower. When the flower starts to, you know, the ovary starts to open, nematode starts feeding, introduces the bacterium. It's a very cool system. But the deal is, this bacterium produces a seriously nasty toxin. It's called tunicomycin. And it's very toxic to livestock and wildlife. And every year in Australia, livestock die. Over the course of, say, the last 20 years, a couple hundred thousand sheep, cattle have died from ingesting this toxin. So we don't want this in the United States. Um, <clears throat> the challenge is that the vectors, the nematode, is present in the United States. And susceptible hosts are present in the United States. So if it gets in, it has a pretty good chance of getting established and in time spreading around. And the, the environment would support this. U.S. imports annual ryegrass seed. That's a problem. That's the main host. And so we already have a pathway that would allow for this organism to get into the United States. The threat, about a $100 billion livestock industry in the U United States. That's a big deal. <coughs> so the way, <coughs> suppose it gets in. Well, just contain it. Right? That's the strategy. But here's what happens, and this is a field in Australia. And you can see the bales of hay from ryegrass. That's ryegrass hay. And what happens, of course, is that they load those bales onto a truck, and they take it either to a storage area or to another field to feed the animals. And if you look, I don't know how well you can see this, but I'm going to show you. Look at these. Those are the tire tracks behind the hay wagon. Okay. Let's take a close look. <laughs> this is lolium rigidum, ryegrass. So as they're moving these bales of hay from one field to another, the seed are falling off, and you're contaminating, you're infesting, basically planting the whole area. And this is what happened. It's an invasive species now in Australia. It was introduced intentionally many, many years ago to feed livestock, but it has become invasive. So the concern is real. If it gets into the United States, there are many mechanisms by which it could spread. So, uh, Mohammed Arif in my lab is, is working on this. The issue is that when the uh, livestock graze on this, either in a pasture or adjacent to a pasture, they die. Uh, and every year, livestock are dying from this. This is the team. So we, we have to go <coughs> and find this organism in its natural environment so we can get many, many, many strains so that we can understand the genetic variation. So we spend a lot of time uh, out collecting. Uh, we're going to be back in Australia for the next three weeks, Australia and New Zealand. We go to many different habitats from rangeland to cropland to natural areas, and we're collecting this host that's, uh, as I said, invasive. And one thing you have to be careful of, of course, in Australia when you're out in the, <laughs> in the uh, wild hinterlands uh, is you encounter very interesting organisms. That's one of the most deadly snakes uh, in Asia. And we've encountered, uh, encountered him just last year. So what we do is we look at the organism. We look at what its capabilities are. We've sequenced the genomes. And in fact, what we found is that in the last 10, 
12 years, a new population has emerged in Australia. So we're studying that, we're doing comparative genomics. We have 54 uh, isolates, strains that we have sequenced the entire genome for, and we're doing those comparatives and basing our diagnostics. And you can see those little boxes, these little boxes here. These represent where there's either a sequence missing or a sequence present that's not present in others. So we again focus in and base our diagnostics on that. One of the other organisms we work with, Fusarium proliferatum, is a fungus. So the first two were bacteria, and I'll tell you a little bit about the two fungi. Uh, this is a PhD student just finishing up. This fungus is spread around the world in maize seed, many other seeds. It, and it, it causes disease in some plants, but not in others. It's not a real huge pathogen. It's not one that gets in and like, devastates a whole field. It doesn't do that. But what it does do is it produces a really bad toxin. It produces a toxin called Fumonazin B1. It's regulated by our Food and Drug Administration, a tolerance of four parts per million for humans. That toxin has wide-ranging activities. It causes a disease called leukoencephalomalacia in horses. Basically, it liquefies their brain. It causes pulmonary edema in swine. That's a pneumonia. And it causes esophageal cancer in humans. So it's a very bad toxin. But we're moving it around the world all the time. And the important thing is that some strains produce almost none of that toxin, and others produce a lot. So it matters which strains you're moving around. So we're trying to develop diagnostics. We're trying to better understand that. And uh, you can see this maize seed, this particular lot, 70 some odd percent of the, the kernels in that seed lot had Fusarium proliferatum in it. And this is a normal production cycle for maize. So it starts in one area, goes out to Hawaii, goes to the Pacific Northwest, goes to Argentina where they do produce the seed for commercial uh, use, and then it comes back into the United States and it gets planted out. So at each one of those stops, there's an opportunity to acquire new strains. So we're looking at that, so what? So the, the fungus is in the seed, does it matter? Does it just die when the seed decays ultimately? So we're trying to figure that out. So we've done that in a couple different ways. We've created genetic markers. One of them is to, to make it fluoresce so that we can see that strain. And we're then tracking that strain in microcosms to see when you plant the seed in the soil, does it just stay there or does it come out and get established in that environment? And his research has shown that it in fact does come out, does get established in those environments. Um, so we're using genetic technologies to allow us to track individual strains. Uh, he did a, 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 a field experiment to va validate this just this past year using, again, genetic technologies. The other fungus we're studying is called uh, Magnaporthia rhizae, a very important pathogen emerged in Brazil back in 1985. Didn't do, it didn't spread much for a few years, but then in the 90s it spread to Bolivia, uh, early 2000 to Paraguay, and it's causing massive epidemics uh, in Bolivia on a regular basis. It, affects the leaves, affects the heads. When it affects the heads, uh, you don't get much seed or very, very low quality seed. One of the things we're doing is trying to figure out, so what's the likelihood this will get into the United States? So we've developed some models, uh, pathway analysis. You figure out where this organism exists. Is there a way for it to get there? You identify the critical steps and you assign probability distributions for each step. And then ultimately it results in a map of uh, susceptibility, you look at the climatic conditions in the U.S. and say, where do the climatic conditions match for where it currently exists causing epidemics? And so you then ultimately end up with a probability saying that it's quite likely to get introduced in 26 years or less. So uh, we try to figure that out. Again, look at the seed from a blasted. <laughs> That's where you get seed. This might look like a normal wheat field at the end of the year. It's not. Look at the, all the leaves are green. These, all these heads were killed by the fungus. And it's impressive when you see an epidemic where the whole field, the heads look like this. So uh, we do some of the work here at our Biosecurity Research Institute. Everybody know what that is? Okay, yeah. Um, we are working on lab and field deployable tests to be able to detect this thing at ports of entry or out in the field when you're doing surveillance. This is some of the work we do up at BRI. Uh, since Kansas is the wheat state, we want to make sure this thing doesn't get out. So we take extreme precautions with that. 
And this is actually a shower out lab. So when we're done working with the organism out there, actually all the, uh, the uh, lab attire stays in the lab, gets autoclaved, and we shower out. I teach a course in May, one week short course called Biosecurity, Plant Biosecurity in Theory and Practice. Last May we had 36 participants from 14 countries. We have a lot of fun. It's a, an interactive uh, week, uh, including training in the BL, uh, BSL3 lab, training lab. So this isn't an actual research lab. This is their <laughs> training lab. And I'm mentioning this because I still have a few scholarships. If any of you would like to experience this, um, talk to me, and we'll get you into the course this year. So what is biosecurity? It's fundamentally about two things. It's about containment, and it's about exclusion. It's about Keeping organisms, uh, and that concept applies across all scales, whether you're talking about a field, a geographic region, whether you're talking about a building or a laboratory. It's about containment and exclusion. It's about keeping specific organisms confined to certain areas and keeping certain areas free of specific organisms. So the plant biosecurity challenge then is to protect natural and managed plant systems from biological threats that undermine productivity and sustainability. So that's what I mean by plant biosecurity. Why does this even matter? Um, they're just plants. Well, if we look at the major challenges we're facing this century, water, food, energy, public health, climate change, biodiversity, for each one of these plant systems contribute to both the problems and the solutions. What fossil fuels were to the 20th century, food and water will be to this century. Many people believe this. Plant health is prerequisite to public health and human well-being, and I'll try to make that case in a moment. Plant health is undervalued and at increased risk. A few years back, UN did the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. So they looked at ecosystems around the world, and they got teams of experts together and said, what do you think? Well. 17% of plant systems are critically endangered. 19% endangered, 38% vulnerable, another 30% at low risk. So when we look, do the math, over two thirds of the plant systems that underpin human health and well-being are threatened or endangered currently. <clears throat> there are over 250,000 plant species described or predicted. 30,000 plant species are edible. 7,000 plant species are currently used for food, and 120 plant species are cultivated. However, just five plant species provide 63% of the calories consumed by humans. Just five. 11 provide 93% of the calories consumed by humans. The same 11 species that we've been consuming for 10,000 years. So the notion that we're going to find a new plant to develop into a meaningful crop in the next couple decades is not realistic. We can transition to that over a longer period of time, but it's not going to help deal with the crisis we're about to face. Plant health is essential to food security. We eat plants and we feed plants to the animals that we eat. When we consume plants, we get protein. When we first pass those plants through an animal to get our protein from animal, which is a higher quality protein, it takes three times as much plant matter to provide the human with, uh, humans with their requirement for protein. So as we see standards of living increasing, it's always correlated to an increase in meat consumption, always. So as we look at adding more people to the planet and their standards of living increase, there's going to be increased pressure on plant systems to provide the protein necessary. Increased demand for food is nonlinear with respect to the population. A 30% increase in global population may require 70 to 100% more food. Now that was from FAO, the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization. I don't believe those numbers and we'll get to that in a minute. So feeding a growing population in a shrinking world, this is a global issue that will affect us locally. This is a plant health issue that will affect everyone. It will determine what foods are available. It will determine how much you pay for that food as a proportion of your income. 
It will pay, determine how much you pay for water. Yes, how much you pay for water. Food security is not about keeping people alive. It's about keeping people healthy. It's, about, it's not just about providing calories, which is what you see in most of the literature from FAO and things. It's about so many kilocalories per capita per day. It's not really about that. It's about providing safe, nutrition, nutritionally balanced, and culturally relevant food to everyone. Can we? Can we provide uh, enough safe, nutritionally balanced, and culturally relevant food for everyone? Can we do that? Well, we'll see. Let's look at where we're at now. On October 31st of 2011, the world reached 7 billion people. <coughs> 2 billion people live in poverty, a billion people are food insecure, and 100 million people live at risk of starvation. 1980s, there were 15 food emergencies per year. In the previous decade, 30 food emergencies per year. And those food emergencies were spread around the world and not just located in Africa. In 2010, 93 million people in 70 countries required food aid for survival. And this is an annual thing. So how are we doing with 7 billion people? Not particularly well. For the past 25 to 30 years, we've been unable to meet the minimum basic food needs for 20 to 25 percent of the world's population. Not, a, not an impressive record. Every year we add 65 million more people to our planet. That's nine more New York cities every year. By 2025, we'll hit 8 billion. By 2043, 9 billion. That's a 28% increase in the next 30 years. Think about that. 28% more people on the planet in the next 30 years. The population challenge is not just a numbers problem, it's a demographics problem. We have increasing urbanization. We crossed the threshold a few years ago where over 50% of the world's population lives in an urban setting. That's going to rise to almost 70% this century. It's an inverted age structure. A lot of old folks, gray hair. And migrations, people move. In 2000, 189 nations signed a declaration called the Millennium Development Goals, to eradicate extreme poverty, alleviate extreme hunger, improve public health and nutrition, ensure environmental sustainability. What is food security? It's access by all people at all times to enough food for an active, healthy life, according to the World Bank. According to FAO, it's all people at all times have both physical and economic access to the basic food they need. U.S. Agency for International Development, when all people at all times have access to sufficient food to meet their dietary needs for a productive and healthy life. So food security is about the availability and the affordability of food. There's what's called a hunger poverty cycle. People who are hungry become malnourished, they earn less, a lot of data to support this. They earn less and they drop into poverty. Those in poverty cannot afford to purchase enough or the right kinds of food become further malnourished, drop further into poverty. So we need to alleviate poverty in order to eradicate hunger but we need to eradicate hunger in order to alleviate poverty. And this is a conundrum that's extremely difficult to break into in many countries. Food security is about the availability of food and the ability to access food. When we think of population, our minds are naturally drawn to Asia because the two most populated countries on the planet are in Asia. China and India represent one third of the world's population. But what about our own neighborhood? When we think of hunger, we think of Africa, but what do we think of when we think of North America? Well, let's take a look. 2012, the population was 313 million. It's about 322 right now. In 2050, it's projected to reach 403 million people. That's 28% more people in the United States than we have now. And by the end of the century, the population of the United States is going to be 570 million people. That's 82% more people in the United States than we have today. Think about that. We had one person every 14 to 16 seconds. That's when you take into account births, deaths, and immigration. Consequence, the U.S. is currently a major food exporter. As population grows by 82%, will we still be able to export food? The ugly answer is, yeah, probably. Because food is a commodity, and it will be sold where it gets the greatest value. 
And at what will it cost? When we look at the cost of food, it's not really the actual amount, it's what proportion of your income does it represent. So in the United States, the mean for how much money we spend on food is 9 to 11%. There's a lot, there's huge variance around that mean, but that's, it's a useful statistic. In South America, it's 47 to 72% of their income on food, depending upon which country and whether you're rural or urban. In Asia, 52 to 75%. In Africa, 67 to 86% of their income on food. When food is 10% of your income, and there's a 50% increase in the price of food, you adjust. You buy fewer strawberries. When food is 80% of your income, and there's a 50% increase, it becomes 120% of your income. You can no longer afford food. And that has happened repeatedly over the past decade. Food for commerce versus food for consumption. Crops for food versus crops for fuel. These are issues that need to be addressed and we need to strike a balance. Consequences, population grows, the demand for food will grow and the cost of food will increase. This is not just an issue for developing nations. In the United States, the highest 20% of income earners spend about 7% of their income on food. The lowest 20% spend 37% of their income on food. This is in the United States. 45 million people require food assistance almost every year. This is not just a developing nation issue. As the cost of food rises, standards of living will fall and the numbers in poverty will increase. So, <laughs> what do we do? What should we do? Well, uh, there's fairly good agreement among the government organizations, non-government organizations that look at food security, but there's very little agreement across the scientific community. There's a lot of different perspectives on how we achieve food security. FAO says we need to increase food production by 100% in 2008, 110% in 2010, 90% in 2011, 70% in 2012, and 2014 they said 60%. We don't really know how much more food we need. <laughs> um, we've done our own calculations in my lab. We think the estimates are really 24 to 43%, depending upon the assumptions you make about food loss and how much of that can be prevented or recaptured. So, but even 24% is a huge number. Remember, it takes about eight years to develop a new wheat variety. There's no new land or water to develop, so we have to make more use of what we have. That's the only way we're gonna feed everyone. International Water Management Institute. So, we need to increase food production by 70% over the next 25 years. 90% of that will come from intensification of existing production systems. That's what FAO said. So, the current production areas, we need to get a lot more out of them. Many nations will remain unable to achieve food self-sufficiency. So, let's look at 90% intensification. What's that mean? Well, it normally means genetically uniform, high-yielding varieties, and of course, all the vulnerabilities that go with that. More efficient fertilizers and pesticides, and all the toxicities and human health issues that go with that. And it means improved irrigation systems, and all the water issues that go with that. Currently, 70% of the Earth's fresh water goes to agriculture. So let's stop irrigating. Only 23% of the world's cropland is irrigated, however, it provides 40% of our food. Um, it increases yields dramatically. So there's almost no scenario under which irrigation is not going to be important in feeding 9 billion people. Daily drinking water requirement per person, 2 to 4 liters, but for their food, it's between 2,000 and 5,000 liters. Remember, we're adding 2 billion more people to the planet. Sanitation is the basis of public health. Water is the basis of sanitation. As population increases, there will be intense competition for water. Future water demands for human consumption, sanitation, and agriculture will require the equivalent of 20 more Nile rivers by 2030. Production practices create opportunities, but not always good ones. So what we've seen across the globe is as we introduce irrigation, it's good for the crops, it's also good for the critters, and we've seen uh, irrigation projects become excellent nesting beds for mosquitoes. 
And those mosquitoes feed on the people, the farmers and the uh, people in the adjacent villages, and they vector many human pathogens, and we've seen a spike in malaria uh, in recent years. But here's the challenge we have, that intensified production almost always results in pesticide application because as you homogenize, you create good conditions to allow populations to increase of either pathogens or pests. So you apply pesticides repeatedly and ultimately you get pesticide resistance in those pest populations. So your yields start to decline. Uh, and unfortunately, what's also going on here is mosquito populations and things are declining, but they're also vulnerable to those pesticides. So when you apply the pesticide, you knock it back the mosquito populations. But when you get pesticide resistance and they're no longer effective, what we do is we develop resistant varieties. Plants that don't require the insecticide, they're just resistant to the insect pests. And so you stop applying your insecticide, the yields go back up to what you want, However, your mosquito populations continue to increase. And this has been well documented in several places, irrigation, uh, increased populations in ir uh, irrigation systems, 550 bites per person per day for the people who work in the fields. Uh, malaria prevalence increased about 34%. Outbreaks correlated to rice production cycle. It's right when those spikes in malaria are occurring when people are in the field dealing with the rice plants. It's also associated with dams that are creating the water for flood irrigation. Uh, malaria prevalence seven times higher in children near dams than in control communities. That was done, <laughs> actually, so that study is specifically Ethiopia, there's one Sri Lanka. This has now been repeated in, in four or five countries, very good studies. So you look at the incidence near dams and the <laughs> control population, it's dramatic. So as we implement those intensification practices to raise food production, we have other issues. So we need to increase food production by some number. It's going to cost energy because as you improve people's lives and we further urbanize our populations, energy consumption goes up dramatically. And water consumption goes up. So there's a nexus, so food, water, energy nexus. And what's our solution to food security, food insecurity? It's will achieve security through trade and aid. All the, all the agencies that are responsible for this are saying we're going to do this through trade and aid. But it takes energy to move food. And when you move food, you move water. Just think, even grain is 9 to 12 to 15 percent water. So when you're talking about moving millions of metric tons of grain from one area to another, you're moving water from one place to another. Now imagine the horticultural crops that are 50 to 75 percent water and you're moving millions of metric tons. You're moving water. Many nations will remain unable to achieve food self-sufficiency. Half the world's population will live in areas of high water stress by 2030. Many food deficit, deficit import uh, countries are water inefficient. They require much more water to produce the same amount of food. So, Efficiency of crop production is, varies across the, the planet. I mean, it's just every place is different. In the U.S., we may look at water as a local issue, but there are growing efforts to look at water as a global resource. So there are groups proposing the global regulation of food distribution and water use. What a horrible idea. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you why in a minute. That's a really bad way to look at this. Virtual water concept, and I encourage you to look into this. I don't have time to talk about it today. Oil conflicts were central to the 20th century struggle over fresh water. It's a new turning point in the world order. Half the world's population will be living in areas of high water stress. Over one billion people are going to remain hungry. Food security is very tightly linked to national security. Everybody remember the Arab Spring? No? <laughs> What's going on in the Middle East across northern Africa into the Middle East? started a few years ago. Now there were many underlying social, cultural, and political problems, but the proverbial last straw was an increase in the price of food. That is what pushed that food vendor over the edge and went out and set himself on fire. And from that, we have a completely destabilized region of the world. That's what's likely to play out if we don't get a grip on this. 
region of concern, Africa. Now historically, lots of food shortage problems in Africa, but several nations are buying land in Africa to produce food for export. So we identify one of the most food insecure regions of the world, and we have many other countries buying land there to keep an ag, but to export the food elsewhere. This is becoming problematic. Several investment firms are buying water resources globally because they know that's where the power is. The power is going to be in food and water this century. You can go online. Uh, I haven't done this in about two years, but there was a firm in Europe that trying to attract investment to buy land in Egypt and a few other places in uh, East Africa uh, to keep in ag and to get hold of water resources. And we're talking, the minimum investment was 5 million euros. And they had a lot of response. So there's going to be intense competition for these resources. Hunger's tied to civil unrest. When people get hungry enough, they move, and populations on the move are prone to conflict. Do you remember 2008? Probably not, but I do. <laughs> um, we had food protests and riots in at least 30 nations spread across the planet. Haiti, um, Pakistan, Argentina, and uh, Kenya. And these are just a few of them. It resulted in the overthrow of two governments, all about the sudden increase in the price of food. The same scenario played out at the end of 2010, early 2011. Some believe it's going to play out every two to three years for the next 50 years until we get this settled. So what are we going to do? Because many nations are going to remain unable to achieve food self-sufficiency. We must open up the global markets, boost trade, make reforms to help the poorest. And what this means is we need to start relaxing our phytosanitary regulations that are keeping us from moving uh, plants and plant products around. Trade restrictions must be avoided, especially at times of scarcity. <laughs> food security through trade and aid. That's the main uh, mantra. The problem is when we do that, we move pathogens and pests. Where does our food come from? Well, it comes from the grocery store. Okay? But the better question is, where's the grocery store get their food? Do you look at the labels when you go buy stuff? Do. It's very instructive. Exotic fruit. There's a section, exotic fruit. But it comes from Honduras, Mexico, South Africa, Australia, Argentina. It comes from all over the world. This is the way we do business now. There's an area in the Negev Desert in, in, uh, in Israel. And I'm generous when I say less than five inches. They normally get less than two inches of rain a year. But it's a major production area for produce because they're tapping the water out of the ground, which is salt seas going down. But they're tapping the water out of the ground, and most of this is for export. It gets in and shipped to Europe. It's good money. From several nations on different continents, we harvest, inspect, pack, ship to the US, then inspect and ship to retail centers in 48 to 72 hours. The problem with that is that's much less than the latent period for most of the organisms for which we have concern. That holds true for humans, as well as plants, as well as animals. So symptom-based inspection and interception protocols are going to miss this. Recent Ebola case, good example. Everybody remember that? The person was inspected in Liberia, was it Liberia? No. Um, Sierra Leone. I can't remember where, where they got on the plane. They, were, they went through the inspection. They were fine. Got on the plane, got off in Boston, were fine. Two days later, came down with Ebola. Symptom-based <laughs> detection is not going to work. Just doesn't work. Almost all nations are connected to other nations by trade and travel networks right now. The plant systems of most countries are connected to the plant systems of most other countries by trade and travel networks. Consequently, the plant pathogens and pests of most countries are now connected to the plant systems of most other countries by trade and travel networks. The geographic boundaries that once kept organisms confined to certain areas have become irrelevant. We put plants on airplanes, airplanes and we fly them over mountains, we fly them over our deserts, we put them on ships and transport them across oceans. <coughs> There's nothing to keep organisms confined to their spaces anymore. Now trade, global trade's not new. We've been doing it for thousands of years. But what is new is the magnitude of trade and the speed with which we move people and products around the world. 
In less than 72 hours, we can get from Manhattan, Kansas to almost anywhere in the world. Ask Sean, he does it. And the reciprocal. 72 hours is less than the incubation period for most of the organisms that cause us concern. That's a map of Kansas. I took this this morning. This is, each icon is an actual airplane in flight at 8 a.m. this morning over the flight over Kansas skies. Okay? Let's look at the United States at 8 a.m. this morning. Now, I, <laughs> I couldn't really go forward in time, so I took an older image I had. Let's look at 8 o'clock at night over the United States. Each airplane, each icon is an actual airplane in flight. If you want some entertainment, go to flightradar24.com. You can click on an icon. It will tell you which flight it is, which flight number, what kind of flight. Is it cargo? Is it air? It'll tell you how many passengers and where it's going, where it came from. You can learn all that. Just click on the icon. So it's a radar shot of any point in time. And it's not just the United States. That's the world. We're moving a lot of stuff, including people. Every day there are six million cargo containers on ships on the oceans and seas across the world. And every year, 10,000 of those cargo containers fall off the ships and some of them wash up on shores and spill their contents. 2007, 48 million metric tons of agricultural products were imported into the United States. Uh, 1.2 billion live plants. 2.6 million pounds of seed that were grown elsewhere and they're being brought into this country to grow, to plant out in the environment. Thousands of potentials are in intercepted annually. Um, there's one bridge, Nogales, Arizona, uh, that 2,000 trucks a day go across that bridge from Mexico to the United States carrying produce. $20 million of business a day comes across the one bridge. Only one to two percent are inspected, and there's a very long list of pests and pathogens that have been introduced by a trade. So they just, there's been this major policy shift across the planet. It's, it's just being launched, it's just starting. So we used to inspect about one to two percent, we stopped. We're not inspecting that way anymore, so no more routine inspections. We're gonna do risk-based inspection. So if we know of a problem in a country on a particular crop, we're gonna invest our time and energy in making sure that doesn't get in. The only problem with that is what I said before, you know, that a lot of these things jump hosts when they go from one place to another. Evolution of new species. Plant trade has resulted in the evolution of new plant pathogen species with novel host range and virulence patterns that could not have been predicted from the parental phenotype. Uh, the one case, I'll tell you, there's several, but one, uh, they had a shipment of nursery plants from South America and from Africa into the UK. They ended up, some of these plants ended up in the same nursery adjacent to each other. They each had a species of the pathogen called Phytophthora, two different species, different host ranges. Now, different species, they shouldn't interact, but they did. They hybridized, formed a new species, and the host range and virulence pattern could not be predicted by the parental phenotypes. So it was pathogenic to an entirely different host. That's what we need to be prepared for. So what are these impacts on human health more directly? You know, uh, Recycling's good, right? So we recycle automobile tires. We're very good at that. So we actually not only recycle our own, we import them from other nations to recycle. So several years ago, we brought in a shipment of tires from Japan into the port of Houston, 1985. But in the tires, there was water. And in the water, there were the larvae of Aedes albopictus, the Asian tiger mosquito. And the Asian tiger mosquito is a really efficient vector of human pathogens. It got established in the port of Houston and it's now spread to, well, it's, I got to update this, it's about 34 states now. The, and the challenge with 80 species is they feed during the day. So when people are most out and about is when they feed. And many 80 species are well adapted to urban environments. So it's a really good vector to move around these pathogens. So uh, several uh, traits make it particularly alarming, but being a good neighbor of the international community, not only do we import, but when we have a surplus, we export used tires, and we did that in 1992 to Italy, 
And of course, in the tire was water, and in the water was 80s albopictus larvae, and it got established in central Italy and spread. Now what happened in 2007 is some Italians went on holiday to India, and while they were there, they got bit by mosquitoes, and those mosquitoes were carrying the chikungunya virus. Has everybody heard of chikungunya? Oh, look that up, it's fascinating. <laughs> now, the interesting thing about chikungunya is that population of uh, the virus had a single base pair mutation. So you know base pairs, you've all had, you know, so you've got a lot of bases in a genome. <coughs> One change changed its vector from 80s Egypti to 80s Albopictus. So when those folks went back to Italy, there was this great population of 80s Albopictus already present. And of course what happened is um, it got established and spread and the consequences are ama amazing. Consequence of this, major outbreak in Italy, thousands became ill, blood donations were restricted because it's a new pathogen. So now there are critical blood shortages in hospitals, organ donations restricted, so it's very difficult for people to get organ transplants. There are likely many of these scenarios going on all the time. So this is not a minor issue. It's not just about plants. So what does this have to do with plant biosecurity? Well, ornamental bamboo plants, we import them all the time. Everybody's seen them on, in offices, these little bamboo plants. The uh, Netherlands imports a cargo container a week, about a million plants. And of course, on those plants was the Asian tiger mosquito, and it gets out. And it wasn't just the Netherlands. Uh, it happened here in the United States too, got into California the same way, spread from California to Florida. Economic islands are not geographic islands. Uh, economic islands, not geographic islands, determine biodiversity. It's the trade pathways now. Cargo ships disperse organisms, more trade, more organisms. Economic isolation may protect native species. So there's a, an economist, Charles Perrings at Arizona, uh, he spent his whole career studying invasive species, the impacts, the economic implications, and he said the risks from aid are higher than the risk from trade. Moving a cargo container contains a sample of organisms at each location. And it's a very good way to think about it. It's much like what I was saying about seed earlier. Each place that stops, it acquires new organisms. And we've seen that. There are many examples of introducing pests with food aid. So you do this emergency food aid, you hurry up and get what's available and you ship it to another country, and of course you've introduced new species when you do that. So plant biosecurity is essential to food security, and this is the paradox. Plant biosecurity is essential to food security. The strategy for food security is trade and aid. Trade and aid undermine plant biosecurity. So who thought this through? Solution is the problem. Should we stop trade? No. We must construct trade and provide, we must conduct trade and provide aid responsibly if the solution to food insecurity is increased trade. Invest in plant biosecurity infrastructure. We're not doing that. We're grabbing underdeveloped nations into the trade market and they don't have the infrastructure to do it safely. Uh, I'm just gonna, <laughs> there are so many reasons. FAO did an assessment and all the systems that are in place to protect these countries aren't working. So not only are, are we sending them organisms that they're not prepared to deal with, they're in turn sending them back out. Um, I'm gonna just, I don't, I, actually, where were we time? But, so, uh, similar implications for global climate change. Uh, and e this is a trade organization saying we need to wake up before it's too late because now things are approaching critical thresholds. And uh, just to give you an idea of the impact on plants, plants are now flowering 10 to 12 days sooner at several locations around the world. There are numerous implications for that, and that was a study published in Nature. And I'm sure you've heard at some point about the extreme uh, weather conditions and the frequency, all have major impacts. One interesting one from my perspective, because I'm a pathologist, is the permafrost in Russia is melting rapidly. You say, well, okay, good, it's opening up more land for agriculture. Let's look at some of the implications. Seeds that have been frozen for 30,000 years germinate and flowered. Seeds that were <laughs> frozen for 30,000 years were still viable. Plant pathogenic bacteria dormant in those seed are still viable. So the crops we're growing today are unlike, they're likely to be naive 
to the genotypes, the virulence profiles of those other organisms. Whole strange expansion is happening. It's, it's just uh, a fact now. Um, I'm going to skip through this. One of the big areas of concern is India, and I'll just get to that. Why? Because it's the second most populated nation now, but it's going to become the most populated within the next 10 years. It will uh, surpass China. China's population is actually pro uh, predicted to decline this century from 1.3, 1.25, 1 1.3 billion down to 900 million. But India's is going to continue to increase. One of the challenges, of course, is that they're just barely food secure now. And if you look at all the climate change models, the primary wheat production belt will no longer sustain wheat if it's even close to being correct, these models. People will migrate and that will create tensions. So we go back to our goals. We want to decrease hunger, decrease poverty, and increase standards of living. As population increases, demand for food, all these pressures on plant systems are going to intensify in your lifetime. So, I oftentimes get, wow, how depressing. No, how exciting. You're in a position, I'm not joking, you're in a position to, to choose a career that matters, that actually matters. These things are going to happen, they need to get resolved, and they will get resolved. Be part of that. Um, so, if you want to be successful, you need to make good decisions. In order to make, make good decisions, you need information. And, what oftentimes controls the rate of flow through this process is experience. It allows you to sort out relevant from irrelevant information, draw on past experiences, the ones that worked, the ones that didn't work. We are rich in experience of hunger in the world. We have a lot of experience. We can just go back, these are the ones I learn about because I'm a pathologist. The Irish potato famine uh, in 1840s, where a million died and a million emigrated from a plant pathogen that was introduced and went wild, killed the potato crop. A hundred years later, the Bengal rice famine, three million died of hunger and hunger-related illnesses. And this was, this was a consequence of the war, though. So we'll say we, we have a lot of experience, <laughs> but how successfully do we use that experience? And that's often a function of policy, because policy provides the framework for decision-making. So if you don't have your policy right, it channels which direction you're going to go. So policy becomes a critical part of this. Policy often generates unintended consequences. So we go back and look at the Irish potato famine. While people were literally <laughs> starving to death in the field, Ireland was food self-sufficient. They were producing lots of cereals, eggs, meat, and fish, but all for export. So while people were literally starving to death in the streets, quite literally, food was being exported out of Ireland. Let's look at the uh, Bengal rice famine, same thing, but this was because of the war. So while people were literally starving to death in the streets, food imports to Bengal were restricted because it was, they were afraid it would fall into the enemy's hands. Policy matters. I'm, <laughs> ecosystem assessment. Intensification of agricultural production is an important solution to the food security challenge. Intensified agricultural production systems are the single biggest threat to the environment, according to the ecological community. So we're at odds here. One group saying this is what we need to do, the other one saying it's the worst thing we could do. Agricultural production systems, major cause of, lo major cause of loss of biodiversity, restoration ecologists have proposed establishing rescue sites around the world. So where there's a threatened species or two, they want to do climate matching and find out where else in the world could we move that whole community to save it. <laughs> <laughs> you'll be introducing so many organisms that will have unpredicted uh, consequences. So, we need informed and balanced policy. The long-term rise of civilization and living standards throughout the world is largely a story about increasing agricultural productivity. Many economists have done studies and the correlations are quite strong. So feeding a growing population in, in, the, in a growing, uh, feeding a growing population, uh, good news is that investment in agricultural research, as it goes up, the cost of food goes down. As the cost of food goes down, poverty and hunger go down. The bad news is, when poverty and hunger go down, investment in ag research goes down, and the cost of food goes up, <laughs> and poverty and hunger go up. So the way we are currently structured, we need to sustain poverty and hunger 
in order to maintain investment in the agricultural research necessary to reduce poverty and hunger. I hope that doesn't make sense to anyone. Past president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science said, nine billion people inhabit planet Earth by 2050. Without agricultural research, there is little hope we can feed them. Um, and we're predict predicting very slow growth in agricultural productivity in the same period of time, we're gonna add two billion people to the planet. 30 years is not a long time. So when you're 25, 30 years sounds like a really long time. But when you're over 55, you can't believe how fast the last 30 years went by. 30 years is not a long time, and we have a lot of work to do. So, when we talk about feeding a growing population, the shrinking world, it, it comes down to three types of questions. Can we? Can we feed 9 billion people by 2043? These are questions of science and technology, and the answer is yes. We can do the science, we can develop the technologies necessary to feed 9 billion people. Not without challenge, the water issue is enormous. So there are challenges, but we can do it. So, yes. The second type of question is, will we? Will we feed 9 billion people by 2043? Those are questions of policy. And as I tried to indicate, policy is a bigger challenge than it might seem. It's hard to get policy, right? Because you're talking about trying to predict the future. And our track record in policy is not very impressive. So will we? Probably, but not before a lot of people suffer, probably unnecessarily because it takes us so long to do what needs to be done. The more interesting question is should we? Should we feed nine billion people in 2043? Now this gets people really nervous when I say this. This does not mean don't feed people who are starving. That's not what this is about. This is about learning from the systems we study. And almost without exception, whether you're talking about microbes, whether you're talking about wildlife, no matter which biological entity you're talking about, their population adjusts around a mean that is directly fu uh, a function of the available resource. So let's make it simple. A bacterial culture. I can predict the number of cells at the end of a fermentation based on the amount of carbon and nitrogen I put in. I put in more carbon and nitrogen, I get more cells. I put in more carbon, I get more cells. I don't know, if you, I don't know what course you've had, do you know what Nicholson-Bailey relationships are, but predator-prey populations, they kind of track each other. It's all about available resource. So the challenge is this. If we keep feeding the number of people, that number's going to keep going up because the world's population is going to adjust around the mean of available resource. <coughs> the problem with keep feeding more is we're putting continued pressure on the systems we need to remain healthy. Whether it be water, whether it be plants, it, it's putting more and more pressure on them so our margin for error becomes smaller and smaller. And so now, what in the past might have been a minor, minor perturbation becomes a big deal. So, should we feed nine, and, and now we're saying 10 billion by the end of the century? Maybe not. Think about it. Have a nice day. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for paying attention, I think. <laughs>